Well, welcome everybody. This is the season finale, the series ender, not the series ender. Oops, the season finale. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we haven't jumped shark. the shark yet. We haven't jumped the shark yet. <laughs> yet, the power of yet. <laughs> this is the season finale of Undisrupted. I'm Carl, he's Adam. Uh, so lots of things we're going to get to. We're going to unpack a lot of stuff. It's just the two of us to end this, end the season. And, uh, it's been a good, it's been a good first season. I think we got a lot we can work on next season. We'll oh, talk yeah. a little bit about that later, but, uh, I'll talk to you about something that's kind of interesting that happens now, um, with, it's been happening before the pandemic. It's happening now. And that's this idea that w- when we don't have a seat at the table, when tech leaders don't have a seat at the table, a lot of times things, decisions are made, especially when it comes to training, um, that we're not even involved in. So like, you'll have a curriculum department this happened to me once where a curriculum department brought in this whole training series um, of stuff and we didn't even have the actual software or the device we're running ipads and i think what they were training on was like flash based or something yeah and like, we just spent a hundred something some thousands of dollars <laughs> and we can't even use it you ever have that happen to you too oh yeah i mean it, it, that's one of those things where it really goes to having those conversations and trying to figure out what's going on uh and it's often difficult as tech directors, because we're so caught up with everything else that sometimes we get out of that world of curriculum. So it really, you really have to have those relationships that extend beyond the the email. You have to kind of catch folks in the hallway to figure out what's going on because those things will happen. Um, you know, I've had it where when I first got to the district I'm at right now, there was a lot of things going on because there was a, a division between technology and curriculum. So, mm. you know, we really had to have a meeting and say, okay, guys, what what are you planning on doing? W- what products are you planning on bringing in? And we actually had to even come up with just kind of a little script to, to give to them to say, okay, here is what you need to make sure you ask a vendor. Uh, Cause we can't necessarily be in all your meetings, but you need to make sure they, that they're whatever their product meets this, these requirements. And then I also told them, hey, man, keep in mind, salespeople will tell you things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and they'll promise that a lot of times they overpromise and underdeliver. Yeah. Uh, so let's make sure we get back in the conversation. But, you know, if they tell you off the top that they can't meet these requirements, then you need to tell them thanks, but no thanks. Yeah. I, 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 many a time I've been in a meeting where, some, where someone's had me come in and look and like, oh, they got the little demo device up and it, it looks magical. And I click, I was like, wait a minute. And I realized those are just slides. I mean, those aren't even like, that's not even, that's like, that's they're, just, they're manipulating the slides to make it look like a website. I'm like, that is just disingenuous. Oh, yeah. And once they take I, the check, they run. Yeah. Yeah, because I hate those. It's like, you know, I, show me a live demo. Don't show me uh, the demo that's a, a, a MOV file that's in your presentation. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I'm going to no, hit no, play no. and then you're going to sit there and, yeah. Well, and it's crazy too, because like there, there are times when, um, you know, I almost, almost, I almost recollect like the, the Godfather, like the meeting of the five families. You almost need to get everybody in there together, right? They all need to be in the mm-hmm. room. And it's interesting because tech, is really plays a part in every department. I mean, the fi- I've, I've had times where the financial office has come up and talked to me about something they've had problems with or the HR department. And it's like, everything kind of funnels back to our department. So it, it's yeah, like- it's, it's really like the technology, it, 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 and it's no shade to any superintendents out there because no, no. everybody has their own structures, but it really has to be uh, an essential function of the system. Everything, relies on technology to some degree, as you mentioned, you know, your financials, your phone systems, uh, email, uh, your point of sale when you talk about your food services relies on some kind of uh, devices or whatever that system looks like, your attendance. So every aspect of the of the system relies on technology. So it's imperative that technology is at the table prior to a lot of the decisions that are being made versus once the decisions are made, then they're told the technology directors are told to make it work. Yeah. Um, and, and it definitely makes folks uh, a little frustrated when those things happen. So it kind of goes back to building those relationships and making sure everyone in your organization has the understanding of the importance and the role that technology plays in, in making, I, I always joke, uh, we, we keep the lights on. So making sure they understand all the things that we have to do to keep these, keep the things right. running. And I mean, they take that for granted sometimes. I mean, it's great. You and I know of a couple of people that are, you know, it's funny. You would think now of all times, like our position is so valuable because of everything that's going through with tech. And, but I know that, you know, before the pandemic, there's been, you know, those are sometimes the first positions they cut sometimes. So it's like, we well, you know yeah. what, we can probably just outsource this, right? We can get someone else. To do. And we had, you and I know some, I won't mention their name, but we know someone who was, who was basically let go and say, you're just going to outsource. And like, as a district, how do you do that? You don't have any single point of contact with leadership. You're just reaching out to a company. You got to have somebody with boots on the ground that's willing to take that. And I just, 
but I understand, you know, schools funding, we got to figure it out. Um, speaking of schools, though, the start of school madness is, is happening, man. I mean, by the time this thing airs, I think we'll be half the schools will have started, maybe or not. Um, <laughs> or shut, I don't know about you. Down. I don't know about you in Georgia, but they keep pushing here. I mean, it's it's like not our local district in Austin, but most districts are going like, hey, if we can go to September eighth before we open, they're giving themselves more time, so they're pushing back to the eighth instead of opening on like the eighteenth, I think, of August. So, what are they doing in Georgia? Yeah, I know uh, my district. We were initially planning on starting school on the third um, of August. And that was our initial start date. But then, you know, we kind of saw the way things were heading. And uh, it was a it was a pretty interesting debate. Like right in the middle of the board meeting, we ended up changing our start date. Uh, they were pushing at one point to uh, after Labor Day or right before Labor Day. Mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think they settled finally. Well, I don't think I know <laughs> they settled on <laughs> August 24th. Uh, but that is depending on anything that's, go that's going on right now. So I know for us, my superintendent is having conversations with the health department like every day. So they're watching the numbers. So if our health department says shut it down, um, she said that she's gonna follow their guidance. So I think a lot of districts in Georgia are trying to follow the guidance of their uh, local health departments. Yeah. But my only problem with the health departments, they don't want to make that call. So no. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to make the call to shut it down because Kick you're it down the, the bad road. guy. Kick <laughs> it down the road, man. That's and I feel like it started it starts with the federal government and then it moves to yeah. the state governments, but then like here in Texas, the the, gov the governor and the the state agency basically said, you know, we're not going to put kids in harm's way. We'll leave it up to the local jurisdiction and the health department and then the health department and then our uh, our attorney general they said no you can't do that you have to open so it's like and then and then here locally it's like schools are basically the superintendents are saying oh, we'll leave it up to the principals like how further how much further down can you kick it before like at some point someone's gonna have to make a decision and say guys we're gonna open or we're gonna close but there was like there's a superintendent named dr woods um here in texas and he uh put out a statement like yesterday that it's getting a lot of fanfare and basically he said i'm not opening our schools because it's not safe you can decide not to fund me i'll see you in court I mean, basically yeah. saying, yeah, you can't, you, good luck taking the funds away. I'm keeping my kids safe and family. So you got teachers on one side saying, we don't want to come in. Then you got parents on the other side saying, you better open, right? Or I'm going to leave mm -hmm. kids in your front door. Um, it's, you know, what do we do as schools? What can we do? I mean, because even when you start talking about some of the, uh, the various models that are out there. I know we're, we are planning on a face-to-face -face model. We gave our parents in my district the option. A lot of districts have done that to give them the option of face-to-face -face or uh, a blended type using an, a learning management platform, Canvas mm -hmm. and Zoom and our camera systems in our classroom or doing a full virtual academy model. But all of those models at some point we need that we want to have the kids in the building and, and i think that is a, that's what everyone needs to understand that i think all education systems want to have their kids in the building that we do understand that yeah. that is the best place for kids but yeah, i think i may have mentioned it on a previous podcast you want them in the building but if the building's on fire you can't have them no. in the building it's like no <laughs> you know, wait the till most, the fire goes away <laughs> the most creative thing i've seen so far i saw this week and it was a school in utah and this guy the principal basically is running around and he's just buying tents you know those like big uh, like almost like wedding tents well, they have now because no one's having weddings so um he went and he found 33 of these things drove all around and he's set up basically school outside of his building so he's basically, he's giving every every speaker, or every teacher their own little PA, putting everyone about 100 feet apart on this huge field. And you can do that where you've got space. I mean, obviously, yeah. inner city New York, you can't do that. And uh, and he said, yeah, he planned to go all the way to Christmas. He said, you know what, when it starts snowing in November, kids show up with your snow clothes because you're going to be outside learning in the snow. Um, <laughs> and that's how they're going to do it. I was like, that's a creative approach, too. I mean, we can't create bubbles, right? I, yeah. Oh, 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 I don't know. You know, <laughs> the, the NBA is trying that right now, you know. Uh, <laughs> We would create a bubble in the school. The kids can't go home. You know, we, we bring the food in and tell the parents, hey, you see your kids in December. Uh, you know, yeah. you, can, you, you can you can Zoom or Skype in and, and see your kids. Uh, we, we just need hog, we need Hogwarts, man. It'll be magical. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's a boarding go. school. <laughs> just keep yeah. it that way. <laughs> Let's turn all schools into boarding schools. I mean, you know, but even you're seeing now with the sports league, uh, they're shutting down some of the baseball uh, games yeah, because they're having some outbreaks. So I, I just hope that the schools have the plan, the backup plan in place to start shutting things down when, not if, but when they start having the cases uh, spiking, uh, because that's that's going to happen. And and with when that does happen, 
you know, it's going to be that that piece to have the access at home for kids because we do still want them to learn. We knew we were in triage mode, uh, putting duct tape on your boat, fixing the leak. But no one wants to put the duct tape boat back in the ocean. We got we, we got to make sure we have some plans in place. So, you know, for, for when that does happen, like, you know, what advice would you give parents? Right. And that's the thing is like we, I know as a parent, I, I'll admit this on the podcast, we've sent our kids in probably questionable i mean obviously before covid but like uh i think you're a little running like 99 degrees i think you're okay you got a little sniffles you know because kids sometimes just like oh i feel you know and i take a you yeah. know cold, pop a, a tylenol and uh yeah, pop, a, pop a tylenol and then roll a can of like cold coke on top of her head <laughs> all right when that when, when they come and do your temperature check uh but i mean that's already happening i mean and here in texas i think a school opened this week and they had the same thing happen it was like it was within the first two days that one kid came in, symptom, it was asymptomatic, next day symptomatic, they had to close down the whole thing. So, yeah. But with, the, yeah. But with the temperature checks, you got to make sure you have the right system in place. I know here, uh, my wife went to go get her nails done. And uh, the way here, they have it set up in Georgia, you have to wait outside and then they yeah, check yeah. your temperature and go in. Well, it was 100 degrees that day. And so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so when they checked her temperature, it was high. And so she had to like sit in the car for a second, run the AC on, get her body yeah. temperature down and get in line again. So that's one of those things hopefully schools are considering when they're talking about checking kids' temperatures, you know, at the bus stops before they get on the bus or when they come in. That whole thing is still gonna delay the school day uh, because you're gonna have those false positive high temperatures. Um, and like you said, parents are gonna pop a towel on the, uh, in the kid's mouth and shoot them out there and see what happens. Because they may not have a choice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we even here, we have our pool we, to go to our neighborhood pool. They check you on the way in, but there's a, one particular lifeguard who holds that little uh, temperature gun, like right up to our foreheads. And, and like two or three times, every time we go, our kids look like their temperatures are high, but all the other ones check them. And just because they hold it at a little, I mean, even the training of how do you hold those things, yeah. that's not consistent. So like there's times when they've seen, oh, your kids got a little bit of fever. And I was like, no, we just walked here and it's hot in Texas, but um what advice do you think for parents though going into this i mean so like we're i, I don't know what you're, you're planning to do with your kids i know you know for us we're we've already pretty much claimed we're going virtual because we can and i know that's something that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to do so we're we're, we're planning on full remote for the first semester what do you what do you guys plan on man we're, go we're we've changed our minds so many times <laughs> um and right now we're still 50 50. <laughs> i think we signed a paper to send them uh to school uh but as we're looking at the numbers and things uh, we've had serious conversations in our household and and as you said you know we are at a point where the technology isn't a problem for us it would just be the child care piece which is one of those things that i know a lot of families across the countries are dealing with especially educators uh that yeah. work in you know my wife is an educator as well so we both work in, a, in our system so how do you have some of that kind of solutions i think we mentioned it in the in our last podcast you were talking about some different uh the learning pods oh learning pod yeah the neighborhood yeah. pods and so those things are going on. But, you know, our, our thing is right now making sure parents are aware of what are all their options are for devices and connectivity. Um, we have a partnership with uh, various device providers. So we have uh, portals that we've created for our parents to buy direct from those vendors, uh, you know, getting those family uh, discounts, 10, 15 percent discounts to try to uh, make, make, e make it easier for those who can't afford to buy and want to buy uh, their own devices. But then, yeah. you know, like everybody else providing the Chromebooks and sending them home with the kids, uh, those things. Um, so what are you guys doing like as far as access, Internet access for folks? I mean, for us, I mean, what I'm seeing is it's mostly uh... I mean, if you can get there's, I know that Austin ISD is handing out 10,000 hotspots, um, but I know that those, I don't even know what the monthly charges on those, but I know that that could probably run up. And I also, I don't know what, the, I haven't seen anything about data caps, but we've talked about that with previous guests, like mm -hmm. be careful those pod, those, uh, those hotspots. So, I mean, I would say if, I mean, for us personally, what we're doing is like, I have, I just got this Euro system, it's e Euro, I think is what's called E-E-R-O, it's an Amazon mesh system. And so we just put it in and I did a, I did a benchmark test before I started. I was like, I'm going to walk around with my kids' iPads. And we're going to do four Zoom calls at the same time and then check network. And we're running at about 12 to 14 megs uh, per second before this mess system. I just put it in today and it's like running, I want to say it's like 135 uh, megs on a, on a wireless download, which is crazy. Yeah. We didn't even, we are doing 200 is what we paid for the upgraded system, but, but we were going to upgrade even more. And I was like, you know what? We don't have to. I think that's enough because I think Zoom says, Zoom says 2.5 is what you should be, 2.5 megabits per second on average for a high quality Zoom call. So if you've got, in my case, three kids all on Zoom at the same time and me, I wanted to make sure I got at least 10 to 20 
on that. But I don't know. I mean, are there other ideas out there for parents? I mean, or See, schools? See, that's the thing. Funded? You you understand that based on your your background knowledge, your educational experience, your job, you understand you know looking for what you need in order to get things done. So I, I think it's very important as technology uh, leaders and school systems that we put that information out to our families. So as they are talking to their internet service providers, yeah. they're able to have the conversations and understand what type of package they need. Cause we don't want, our, what we don't want is parents and families to be upsold um, and getting a gig. And, and when you'd really don't, you don't need, need a gig. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you have two kids and you're doing your zoom and regular work, you know, you don't need a gig. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have that bill. But I know one thing that actually surprised me, I, was, I had a conversation this past week with an internet service provider and they actually are doing something a little unique, uh, well, it was unique to me. And they're coming together with a, a package where districts can pay for home internet for families. And it's it's actually about the same or cheaper than uh, buying a hotspot. Really? So, yeah. And so, you know, it looks like uh, the family gets about, you know, uh, 25 megs, um, you know, up, four down, uh, no data caps, and you'd pay, you you know, so many subscribers, you'd have to say, let's say 500 uh, families that you would provide like a bulk, for. Like a bulk discount, yeah. yeah. And they, they, they do it all touchless, so, you know, the family wants to hook up their router at home, they, they light it up, you plug it in, and it's your wireless, and you pay, you know, your... Thirty dollars, whatever it is, a month, and the district absorbs that bill. Uh, and it's and you know at first I was like, well, that's kind of weird, but I was like, it's no different than buying the hotspots. Like, that's that's true. basically what you're doing. You're buying the hotspot. You're, you're taking it home, and they're doing whatever they want to on it. This way, you're actually getting more people connected in the home because you have families where mom, dad, whoever may need to get connected to, you know, do do a medical visit, uh, right. do a job application, whatever the case may be. And let's be honest, some folks just want to watch Netflix and chill. So, <laughs> you know, the, now they have the ability to do that. What does uh, that, what does that mean? Uh, Netflix and chill. I don't understand. Can you explain it? No. <laughs> um, I do like that. I mean, I think that's, I think that's creative. I, I uh, like here, 10,000 hotspots. I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, you can, if you could just say, oh, we'll pay for 10,000, you know, homes to be connected and it's the same cost, if not less, and you don't have those hotspots walking off. Now it does restrict mobility. I guess you can't like leave to go to the park with your hotspot, but, um, but I feel like the internet would be such a stronger connection. I think the one, one of the ones yeah. you'd sent me to look at it was like, and it was, it was like 50 meg. I mean, it was something like 50 meg download. And I was like, wow, that's, that's decent. Yeah. I mean, that's all you really need. If you have a decent um, wireless uh, router, I feel like that's all you really need. I mean, heck, the kids, if they wanted to play some Fortnite uh, or Call of Duty, they still can do that, too. <laughs> I've yet because, to get into, I got to get into Fortnite. I've yet to do that. Maybe uh, one of these years I'll do it. But it'll be, by the time I get into it, all the kids will be playing, you know, whatever, Animal Jam or I don't know, whatever the next yeah. thing is going to be. Yeah. This don't take longer than the Fortnite to do it. Okay. Uh, uh, see, see what I did there? See what I did there? Uh, yeah. Wordplay. Yeah. Uh, so what about, let's, let's, uh, what about some final, little bit of advice for tech leaders as we head into this? I know that you and I talked a lot about you know, collecting and distributing. And, you know, when this happened, I think everyone just kind of threw stuff out like, Hey, here's, here's a bunch of devices. Here's some hotspots. And, and, and then hopefully, and you, you tag it market and you hope that it, you know, it comes back, you have an inventory, but like in our case, you know, when I was working at Eans, we, we pretty much after about two years or three years of the headache of collection, which was just always mm -hmm. so painful. We basically said, you know what, keep it. Um, and when we were lucky, cause we didn't have a lot of loss, um, except for seniors, we would pick theirs up. But I mean, for the most part, it worked out pretty well in terms of the amount of money that we spent on trying to collect versus the amount of money that we saved by the ones that we lost. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what are you dealing with that right now? Yeah. And, and I think you really hit the nail on the head. You have to put those structures in place, the accountability aspects. You have to know who has what device, how many devices are, are been pushed out at various locations throughout the district. Uh, when you're trying to collect it, you know, your emails, your school messenger calls, uh, you know, letters to the house, you know, all those things that you would normally kind of go through. Um, you, you have to definitely take those those steps. And my thing is make sure that you're no, notating all that stuff. You know, if you have tried to reach out to the Smith family, make sure you have just like a classroom teacher, when you have to have those call logs, have all your contact yep. logs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, because, you know, as the tech director, if I come back and say, hey, we have a hundred devices that, that were not turned back in. Um, but I need to be able to say for each one of these hundred families, this is what we've done for each one to try to collect them. 
because I want to make sure they know that we've done our part. And before all this happens, you have to have those conversations with all the stakeholders, especially the people who sign your checks, yeah. that all these things aren't coming back, uh, you know? And so you have to understand what's gonna be a, an acceptable loss, if you will. Yeah. Just like, you know, you have a store, you're gonna have shrinkage or, you know, whatever that case may be, you, you factor that in. Gotta be Whether careful it's 3%, 5%, yeah. 5% yeah. yeah, it gets cold out there. <laughs> uh, especially, you know, you're talking about in Utah and some of those other places yeah, exactly. you're doing things outside, yeah. Uh, so when you have these devices, you it's gotta understand, you know, some of them aren't coming back. It's not that we are saying, oh, well, they're not coming back, but you just have to know that is a fact. Yeah. And I think we, we always plan for like three to 5%, but it was, and it was somewhere around that range. And if, if you can hit, if you get lower, that's awesome. Some, some years admittedly were higher. I mean, in terms of just breakage and loss, and I feel like they're easier to track now, which makes a little, and also like ours would turn into bricks. I mean, yeah. the iPads, the, once Apple started kind of integrating with our systems, like the second someone steals it and they try to re wipe it, it just, they have to log in with our system. So they, it just, it's just a brick at that point. They can't really use it. Um, but it's also like having making people understand sometimes spending all that extra money on platforms to do all that is is overkill you know they want oh can you put lojack on it can you do this and can you do that yeah. it's like okay yes you can put all that on but who's going to get in the squad car and you know go down the street and be like book him dano like you yeah. know <laughs> he's running down the back alley with the ipad go get him you know <laughs> Yeah. You know, like you can you can do all that, but you know, what are you going to do with that information if you're not going to have the police or a, a school officer go to someone's house to collect all this stuff? Then sometimes that's money wasted because most of your platforms have some kind of location services. Um, if you're doing some type of management, and you know, hey, it's the last time I hit the network, it was on Smith Street. You know, yeah. After that. You it's know, always, it's always it's always on Smith Street, but yeah, that's yeah. I mean, now you can find my iPhone, so I mean that happens all the time. It's funny, you know, you're right. I mean, I think the most effective uh, LoJack thing I ever saw was that someone had spent like a dollar and a half for these little hologram stickers that said LoJack on them, and they put them on all the devices. They didn't actually put the LoJack in them, but it does. <laughs> it's almost like the my home is protect, protected by ADT. It's got the sign out front. I don't actually have. You know, you, everyone, everyone who's listening is like, oh wait, we can break into his house. I do have a ring. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Once I get on this new network, um, yeah, I've, I've seen your ring. It, it came in handy with Christmas. Uh, Santa, it caught Santa. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And and the Easter Bunny showed up once too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. My kids are very excited about that. Well, so we're we're wrapping up here. We got season one done. What do you think? What what should we? What do we have in store? What do you want to do for season two? We should we should really. I mean, I want to keep some of the format, but I think what do you, what should we change for for the viewers out there? What should they be expecting in season two? What are you thinking, viewers or listeners? You know, maybe we should have like a cliffhanger or something like, you know. Oh, I like it. Yeah. Like, you know, we're, we're telling them what's about to happen. And then all of a sudden the screen goes black. No, no. <laughs> we should totally. That's how we're going to end. That's how we're going to end this episode, by the way. We're going to, we're here going to end that episode. I'm going to make sure I'm going to hit the stop button right before we say it. So that's good. Um, in, the, in the light of Sopranos. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start playing. Uh, yeah. Don't stop believing. And uh, hope that we don't get copyright infringement. Um, and then hit stop. <laughs> no, I do. I, I mean, I think we should do more of the, I like the bits. Uh, I mean, and more of the, like, I think we did it with, um, and by this point they'll probably have seen it, but there's Shad where we did like the, the one word responses mm -hmm. and kind of doing some more of that with our guests. I, I would love to get some more Q and A. So those of you that are listening, I mean, send us in, um, you could tag us, uh, either of us at our, at our Twitter accounts, or, um, we should probably have like an email. If we want to be really professional. We could have like an email, you know, yeah. that would be a good idea. Maybe that's season two. We put that on the books. We, we can go out and buy a, a uh, Gmail account. Uh, do we have expensive. a budget for that? <laughs> <laughs> Our budget is zero. Well, but uh, but we are getting. I mean, AWS is sponsoring us, so we'll uh, see. I mean, maybe we'll get we'll add some sponsorship too. I don't know. I like. The, I don't know. I like that. I also think we should probably hit the the equity stuff a little bit more. We we kind of oh, touched definitely. on it. We touched on it with Sandra, and we touched on it a little bit with a couple of the guests. But I think maybe the more we, because you and I have talked about it for years, and I think maybe it's just we we start to kind of build into that to the conversation. I don't know. I don't know what the fall is going to look like. It's it's going to be different. I know that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know what? That's what's that's that's season two. What the fall? What the fall is <laughs> going it. on? <laughs> WTF? That's the title of season two. What the fall, ladies and gentlemen? You heard it here first. No cliffhanger. Uh, well, you guys will have to tune in and listen because uh, yeah, we don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be exciting, whatever it is. And so, I want to thank, uh, give a shout out to Future Ready Schools and the folks over there for putting Adam and I on the air because. Uh, that took a lot of guts too. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> they don't know what kind of trouble, as you guys have already listened to this podcast and probably heard one or two things that are slightly inappropriate. Um, but uh, yeah, I do, I do appreciate that. So uh, I'm going to, 
going to wrap us up here and say that this has been the Undisrupted Podcast brought to you by Future Ready Schools. And he's Adam. And he's Carl. Remember, we're better together. And we're better undisrupted. undisrupted. This podcast is made possible by the generous support of Amazon Web Services. Thank you.